introduction to the Gospels as this a whole. This meeting is being recorded. Thanks, Chuck. Last week we did an introduction to the Gospels as a whole, and today we're going to focus just on Matthew. And uh, hey, Joel, good morning. You want to grab a lesson plan there, Joel? Uh, it's right on the table. So let's open with prayer. Lord, thank you for this beautiful day, for our health, for sunshine, for our church, and especially for Jesus, who is our King. Thank you for the Gospel of Matthew. At the end of an hour together today, may we understand it much better than perhaps we have before. We ask you to be present with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so what you have today is a lesson plan of three pages. It's going to be a little bit of some material we have to work through today. But I hope I can make it simple. I need to make it simple for myself. And uh, then I hope that at the end of the day, we'll have a better understanding of this. Okay, so what I like to do is just sort of start reading it together at the start. And I'm going to just read the scriptures that we have today I'm, instead of having you, you read them. And I'm going to do that just so we keep it moving. Uh, and, and just I'll make sure. Oh, you should also have a Bible with you. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, be sure you, you go up here and, and, and grab one because we're going to be referring to a number of places in the Gospel of Matthew. Okay, well, make, sure, make sure everybody's got a Bible in front of them. Sure, you want to distribute them. Anybody raise your hand if you don't have one? And uh, next time I'll remember to uh, put them out there with the sheets. All right. So let's start by just that little thing I wrote at the top. Behold the king, the gospel according to Matthew. Um, Again, what we're doing here, what we talked about last week is that what you cannot do with the Gospels is you can't harmonize them and say, well, we're going to put all four together and we're going to create a biography of Jesus' life. Because if we do that, then we miss the intent of that particular Gospel. So what this course is doing now, starting today, Matthew, Mark, next Sunday's Mark, and then Dan will be teaching the class while Cheryl and I are gone. And then Luke and John. And what we're going to do is compare and contrast all four Gospels and see how each one presents a certain picture of Jesus through the literary structure of the author. And the, the, the picture that Matthew presents is not quite the same as Mark's or Luke's or John's. They're all different. So you've got this four-dimensional picture of Jesus, and it's all conveyed by the literary structure. So Mark's theme, uh, if you just look at that first little paragraph, is going to be, behold the Son of God. That's Mark's burden of passion. That'll be next week. Luke's theme in two more Sundays or three more Sundays is behold the Son of Man. Luke has an emphasis on the humanity of Christ. And then John's theme is going to be behold your God. But Matthew's theme is the kingship of Jesus, that he's the king. However, you see my little word in caps there, however, there's also interplay in the sense that each of the gospel writers has elements of the other three. So, for example, in Mark, we're going to see also that Jesus is the king. And in, uh, in Luke, we're also going to see that he's God. It's not just John's theme that he's God, but Luke has it too. But the main theme of each one of them is different from the other three, Okay. So now let me point this board out here, and I'll explain it. I've got three things on here. One, two, three. And what this is is a diagram of, of how the gospel writers use literary structure. And it's the same literary structure that's in the Psalms. Uh, those of you who are in the Psalms, of course, you saw how different the Psalms, you get their message because they have a certain literary structure. Well, this is what we're going to camp on. This means, these two brackets mean enclosure. What that means is the Gospel of Matthew begins a certain way, and it ends in exactly the same way. And we call that enclosure, and that enclosure is a key to the theme of that Gospel. 
This is enclosure with centering. In other words, there are, one of the literary structures of the Gospels is, is not only the enclosure, but there's a centering verse right in the middle. John has this. We'll see John's structure here. Matthew has this. And these little marks here just mean repetition. Ditto, ditto, ditto. And you find that in the literary structure of the Gospels, repetition is key. It's key in Luke. Luke's going to repeat things all through his Gospels. So I just want you to get this picture in front of you. Enclosure, enclosure with centering, and repetition. So if we get these three diagrams in front of us, it's going to simplify today's lesson. Because the first thing we're going to look at is enclosure. Okay, so take, take your sheet out again, and I want you just to look at Roman numeral one. Matthew's theme, and then just flip quickly to page two. You'll see that Roman number two today, we're going to look at Matthew's Hebrew structure. And then Roman numeral or page number three, um, we're going to, just going to go down to the, some footnotes to calls and discussion questions. Okay, so Matthew's theme. Actually, just read with me, please, under, under Matthew's theme. Actually, his theme is Behold the King can be expanded into behold the king of Israel and behold the king of kings. Now, how does Matthew develop this theme? He does it, as I just pointed out, he's going to do it through enclosure and he's going to do it through repetition. Matthew so much won't have the centering, but he'll have the enclosure and he'll have the repetition. And that's the literary structure through which he develops his dimension of Jesus, that he's the king. Okay, let's continue. I'm sure you have your Bible open to Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, verse 1, to start with. Under Matthew's theme, notice there's a letter A, enclosures, and then a letter B, a repetition, and then I'm going to cover a letter C uh, in, in just a little bit. So first, let's go enclosure. Now, I already mentioned how this is structured in the Psalms. For example, let me give you one Psalm, Psalm 8. How does Psalm 8 begin? Very first verse. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. How does it end? Very same verse. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. So when you read Psalm 8, that's how to interpret it. What's in the middle of it, which is the glorification of human humanity, that we're made in the image of God, is not to be usurped as if it's giving glory to us so much as to God. And that's why Psalm 8 begins and ends with exactly the same verse. That's an example. Now, in Matthew, just follow along. I'll call out the verses. We're first going to look at enclosure. Look at 1 verse 1. A record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, son of David, the son of Abraham. The key phrase there is son of David because David was the king. And so Matthew's intent right in the first verse is, this is the son of David I'm going to write about, meaning he's the king. Now flip all the way to the end of the book to 2818. 2818, and what does it say? Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now, isn't that fascinating? Very first verse, son of David. Very last verse, all authority has been given unto me. That's a king word. So do you see that Matthew, right at the start, has enclosure, and that's his clue that his gospel is all about the kingship of Christ and his authority. Okay, then the next paragraph Read 1-1 in 2818. These are the two primary enclosures, but there are secondary enclosures immediately following 1 verse 1 and immediately preceding 2818, which are the two we just read. They are 2 verses 2 to 6. So look at 2 verses 2 to 6. It says right up again toward the beginning of Matthew. What does it say? The Magi came from the east. Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? King of the Jews. We saw his star in the east have come to worship him. And then King Herod heard this. He was disturbed. 
and all Jerusalem with him. When he called together all the people's chief priests and teachers, he asked them where Christ was to be born in Bethlehem in Judea, because as it is written in the prophet, but you Bethlehem in the land of Judah are by no means least among the ruler, among the rulers of Judah, out of you will come a ruler. So you see, he had this primary enclosure right here. He's the son of David. And then right at the visit of the Magi, he's got another one. He's going to be the ruler and he's going to be the king. And Matthew puts both of those right at the beginning. And then we got that last enclosure, 2818, all authority has been given unto me. Okay. There are secondary enclosures immediately following 1 verse 1 and immediately preceding, if you follow the lesson, 2818. They are 2 verses 2 to 6. We just read that immediately following 1 verse 1. Now, turn over to Matthew 21 verse 5. And this is toward, getting toward the end of his gospel. 21 verse 5, it's Palm Sunday. Say to the daughter of Zion, see your king comes to you. And then go to verse 9, Hosanna to the son of David. And then go to, go. that's 21.5. And then go to 25, verse 34. Just move on a little bit in Matthew. 25, verse 34, the parable of the sheep and the goats. Then the king will say to those in his right. Go to verse 40, the same chapter. The king will reply. Now flip over to chapter 27. And look at verse 11, Jesus before Pilate. Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Same chapter, go to verse 29. Verse 29, why can't I find it? And they twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand and knelt and mocked him, Hail, king of the Jews. Okay, so what you see is that these references to his kingship are preceding this final enclosure, all authority has been given unto me. And I guess you could say here that Matthew is also using in these verses we just looked at some repetition. He wants to emphasize this until he gets to this final enclosure. Okay, and those are, those are sort of secondary enclosures. Now, look at the diagram, uh, go to the next sentence. Two primary enclosures with secondary enclosures immediately following, that's the wise men, and immediately preceding, and then I've drawn a little diagram. The primary enclosure is one verse one. Go all the way to the right, the primary enclosure, there's 2818. And in between, he has one secondary or primary one, that's two verses two to six, the wise men, and then these seven secondaries that we just looked at. So I'm going to ask a question in just a second. Just go to the next paragraph. So the two primary enclosures are the genealogy and the Great Commission. And both of them refer to Jesus as king, son of David, remember, at the beginning, at the end, all authority has been given to me. And then the two secondary enclosures are the Magi and the crucifixion, both of which immediately follow and immediately precede the two primary enclosures. Even the cross, by the way, is a depiction of Jesus' kingship. All right, now I'm going to pause. This is, this is the literary structure of enclosure. Is this clear? Yeah, go ahead. Why is the cross a depiction? The oh. symbol of the cross? You, you, I think because of the superscription above him, this is Jesus, yeah. the king of the Jews. Yeah. yeah. But is this clear about enclosure? I want to make sure it's clear. <laughs> okay. Okay. We've got a bunch of stuff to work through here. So, I mean, please raise your hand if you have a question or a discussion, but otherwise I'm going to move on, okay? Because we've got to get through our stuff here. Okay, now let's go next. Look at here. Let's go down here. The second device, literary device he uses is repetition. Now, we've looked at enclosure, okay? And we've looked at kind of these uh, primary enclosure, secondary enclosure, primary enclosure, and then even some repetition. And again, I want you to see, as I love literature, you can tell, um, He's using literary structure to get this idea of Jesus across that he's king. But now let's look at letter B, repetition. There's the repetition of son of David. 
all through his gospel. Now remember, if you took the Psalms class, a repetition was used in the Psalms. I'll, I'll just pick Psalm 24. Uh, the King of Glory, the King of Glory. You go through Psalm 24, over and over he repeats the King of Glory. Well, I guess that's what that Psalm's about. Okay, and it does in a lot of other Psalms too. Now Matthew's doing the same thing that they do in the Psalms. Remember Matthew's a Hebrew. Okay, so under repetition, go back again to one verse one. I'm gonna, I'm gonna flip through the flip through the, the gospel here, go to one verse one. And I just want you to notice in these verses I've listed how son of David is repeated over and over. One verse one, a record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, son of David. Now you don't hear that again until 927, but flip over if you would. To 9, verse 27. As Jesus went out from there, two blind men followed him, calling out, Have mercy on us, son of David. All right, go to 12, verse 23. Jesus and Beelzebub, all the people were astonished and said, Could this be the son of David? Go to 15, verse 22. The faith of the Canaanite woman. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. All right, flip over to 20, verses 30 to 31. 20, 30 to 31. The two blind men received their sight. Two blind men, this is verse 30 of chapter 20. Two blind men were right, and when they heard Jesus Going by, they shouted, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. The crowd rebuked them and told them to be quiet, but they shouted all the louder, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. Now, very next chapter, Palm Sunday, chapter 21. Look at verse 9. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Down to verse 15. Again, they shout, Hosanna the son of David, and then flip over to chapter 22, verses 41 to 45. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? The son of David, they replied. Okay, so do you see that son of David is repeated in Matthew? So not only is he saying, I want you to know Jesus is the king, and I want you to get the clue right at the start and right at the end in these enclosures, but I want you to get a clue by my repetition because the son of David is the king. Okay, I'm gonna pause there and ask, is this clear to this point? Okay, questions, not clear. Okay, now, interesting, yes, yeah, Sandy. A comment I just noticed in uh, 22, Matthew 22, verse 45, if then David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one would say a word of reply. And from that day on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. I just thought that was. That was part, part that would be part of it too. I just didn't read the whole passage, perfect. but that would be part of it as well. Okay. But now there's really something interesting in Matthew. I, I mentioned to you that he's got these two main enclosures about the kingship of Christ. But there are two other kinds of enclosures that I found too. And this is just really interesting. For example, go to letter C, two other kinds of enclosures. There's an enclosure of Emmanuel. Now that's a Hebrew word and it means God with us. God is with us. And I want you to notice in Matthew 1 verse 23 is the first occurrence of that. Find Matthew. Matthew 1, verse 23. The virgin will be with child. You all know this, Christmas. And will give birth to a son. And they'll call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Notice that's right in the first chapter. Now flip all the way over to the last chapter. 28, verse 20. And look at what it says in 28, verse 20. And teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. You'll call his name Emmanuel, right in chapter one. 
which means God with us. And right at the end, I am with you always to the close of the age. This is another enclosure. It's sort of a secondary one, but it's there. And there's one more kind of minor enclosure. And that's letter B, the universal kingship of Jesus goes beyond Israel to the world. See, Matthew is writing primarily to the Jews, and he wants the Jews to know that Jesus is their king. But we know the gospel's not just for the Jews, the gospel's for the world. And Matthew even hints at that with an enclosure. Look at 2, verses 1 and 2 again. Matthew 2, verses 1 and 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. Those are Gentile people. And Matthew is giving us a hint right there that Jesus is not just for the Jews, but for the Gentiles, the Magi. And then flip all the way over to the end of the gospel again to chapter 28, verse 19. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. So he's got the Magi coming right at chapter 2, and he says the gospel's for all nations right at the end. So look at the last paragraph. So even though Matthew is written to the Jews to show Jesus as their king, as the son of David, Matthew has a universal outlook. Jesus is the king not only of Israel, but he's the king of kings, the king of the nations with a mission beyond Israel. And then just flip to Matthew 8, verse 11 a minute. See, 8, verse 11, and that's between these two enclosures of the universal uh, spread of the gospel. Matthew chapter 8, verse 11. Matthew chapter 8, verse 11. I tell you the truth, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. And there's another hint again. Uh, that the gospels for all nations. So you see, you've got these primary enclosures of his kingship. I'm summarizing the first page. You've got the repetition of the son of David. And then you've got these two other kind of minor enclosures. God with us at the beginning. God with us at the end. I'm with you always. And then the magi at the beginning and preach the gospel all nations right at the end. So there's two minor enclosures besides this major one. Okay, this is the first page of Matthew's theme. Is it clear, Dan? <laughs> well, I was just observing that um, those references that we were reading of uh, Son of David are not, well, uh, David was not God. No. And he, he failed a lot. But in the minds of all of those passages seem to be people of the, the street, of the road, who were referring to Jesus as Son of David. Yeah. It shows that they had come part way, but not all the way, yeah. to understanding who Jesus was. Yeah. And it seems to me, I, I could be, I'm not sure about this, but Jesus never says, oh, you can start by thinking of me as Son of David. He doesn't say that. So basically what Matthew is doing is leading us to see the same way from a half understanding of his kingship to a much more yeah. thorough understanding. Is yeah. that right? Yeah, very good point. You know, when they say son of David with the gospel, they don't have like, I hear you say, Dad, is they don't have a full realization of who Jesus is. You get to Paul, he's the king of kings. I mean, his kingship is so much more fuller than they realized. But at least they have this understanding that was there beginning but it was going to grow it was going to right is that the, that's the yeah, point exactly. you're trying to make because for myself as an american to see the son of david is not a convincing yeah uh, message of who jesus christ is to me yeah of course. but it would have been to a jew right and that's who matthew was primarily writing to which is incidentally is why at the church councils when they set the order of the New Testament, they put Matthew the first of all four Gospels because he's got this most direct connection to the Old Testament, which has just ended. Well, it ended 400 years before, but it's the very first New Testament book after the last Old Testament book. So the church father said, all right, we don't need John first. We need Matthew first. 
Okay. Did, yeah, Julie. I was just saying, didn't, um, the prophecies had said that it would come from David's line. Yeah. That the Messiah would rise up from David's line. So I guess I was thinking that the son of David is referring to those prophecies that this is the person out of David's line. Yeah. And so reflecting that this is the Messiah. Yeah. And you're stealing my thunder on the very next page, and that's okay. 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 So, so okay. We understand enclosure. We understand repetition. We've seen these other two kinds of enclosures. Turn to the second page, Matthew's Hebrew structure. And this is what Ju we're going to look at now, what Julie is referring to. Just read the paragraph. This is the second main part. Read the paragraph with me if you would. Matthew was written first to Israel, structured literarily to paint Jesus as their true Messiah King. And that is why when the New Testament canon was ordered, Matthew was placed first. Even though Mark was written earlier, remember we saw last week, Matthew and Luke borrowed heavily from Mark. Mark is the first gospel written, but he didn't appear first in the New Testament. Matthew is intentionally placed as the first New Testament book following the Old Testament because his intent is to explicitly portray Jesus as the fulfillment of the Old Testament. Now, there are three Hebrew structures this is an important sentence in Matthew's literary design that emphasized Jesus as the culmination of the Hebrew Old Testament. So now we're going a little bit different direction. We've seen in this whole scheme, Matthew's point is Jesus is the king. But now we're going to look at three other structures he uses to point to Jesus as the culmination of the Hebrew Old Testament. A little bit different tack. Let's look at them in order here. And I've got three of them. We'll do A, B on this page. There are five discourses in Matthew with identical conclusions. In other words, see Matthew, the way Matthew structured, let me go back to the Psalms. Remember in the Psalms, we saw that the Psalms are divided into five books. And we asked if you were in that course, why do you do, why do, they do that? Well, what the Psalmist is trying to say is, here is a new Torah. Because Genesis through Deuteronomy were the Torah, the books of Moses. And the book of Psalms is intentionally divided into five books, as if the author, as if the compilers of the Psalms are trying to say Jesus is, or not Jesus, he wasn't born then yet, but here is a, there's a new Torah here. Okay. Matthew's doing the same thing. He divides his gospel into five sections. And what he's trying to say by that is here's a new Torah. Here's a new Moses, because he wants his five books to correspond to the five books of the Pentateuch. Now, let's look how he does it. He has five discourses with identical conclusions. The five discourses are chapters five to seven. Okay, anybody, what's chapters five to seven? Anybody remember? Sermon of the Mount. Sermon of the Mount. That's, then there's chapter 10. Then there's chapter 13. And then there's chapter 18. And then there's chapters 24 to 25. Now, how do we know these are five discourses that he structured it this way? Because each one ends with the same formula. All right, let's turn to him. Turn to 728. This is the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount. And I'm just going to run through these and notice how, how this exact same formula ends every single one. So first of all, 7 verse 28 End of the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus had finished saying these things. That's all I want you to notice, when Jesus had finished saying these things. Then go to chapter 10, and this is where he sends out the 12. And in uh, chapter at the end of chapter 1, look at 11, verse 1. After Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples. See how that's a parallel ending to the end of the Sermon on the Mount? Then go to 13, verse 53. This is another discourse. When Jesus, had, it's, it's a discourse on parables. Notice the parable of the sower and all that. But then chapter 13, 53, when Jesus had finished these parables, he moved on from there. Okay, then go to his fourth discourse, and that's in chapter 19. Jump over to Matthew 19. It's again parables and, and just a number of teachings, but look especially at 19 verse 1. When Jesus had finished saying these things, actually the discourse is in chapter 18. 
and, the, and 19 one's the conclusion when Jesus had finished saying these things and then go to 26 verse 1. And this 24 and 25 are, are his discourse on the last times, the last things, you know, the second coming. And then look how that one ends. And this is found in uh, 26 verse 1 when Jesus had finished saying all these things. Now follow along the rest of the paragraph. Please. Identical conclusions proving this five-fold discourse structure is Matthew's intent. And why do you think he did this? Well, remember the five-fold division of the Psalter. The Psalter, they compiled the Psalter into five books to say this has authority as the first five books of Moses. And now Jesus, Matthew is saying, is the new Moses with the new Torah. So is this letter A clear? There are five discourses with identical conclusions. Now we're going to get to Julie's point. Letter B, fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. Now, just read the next paragraph, then, please. All through Matthew, he employs a precise formula that Jesus fulfilled the prophets of the Old Testament. Okay, let's skim it again. Go back to chapter 1. These references are all written out there for you. Chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. All this took, I'm just going to point this verses out. I'm just going to read them so you get the thrust of it. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said to the prophet. The virgin will be with child and give birth to a son, and they'll call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Flip over chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, after the wise men. In Bethlehem and Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people, Israel. Now, same chapter, look at verses 14 and 15. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said to the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. Same chapter, verses 17 and 18. Okay, 17 and 18. Then what was said to the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. This is the slaughter of the innocents. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Notice all four say so that the prophecy would be fulfilled. Okay, then go over to chapter 4, over to chapter 4, verses 13 to 16. I'm sorry, chapter 2, chapter 2, verse 23. Am I getting, I'm getting convoluted here. 2, verse 23. Oh yeah, 2, verse 23. So was fulfilled what was said to the prophet, he will be called a Nazarene. There's the formula again. Then from there, go over to 4, verses 13 to 16, to fulfill what was said to the prophet Isaiah. And then there's the prophecy of Isaiah given. Okay, then go over to chapter 8, verses 16 to 17. Chapter 8, 16 to 17. This was to fulfill. Oh, when evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him, and he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all the sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and carried our diseases. And then if you'll go to chapter 12. Chapter 12, starting at verse 15. Aware of this, Jesus withdrew from that place. Many followed him, and he healed all their sick, warning them not to tell who he was. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. And then a somewhat lengthy quote from Isaiah. Okay, then if you'll go to chapter 13, verses 14 to 15. What does it say again, starting at 13? This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing they do not see, though hearing they do not hear, in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. And he cites the prophecy again. And then will you go all the way over to chapter 21, verses, 40, verses uh, 4 and 5. 21 verses 4 and 5. 
This is the triumphal entry. This took place to fulfill what was spoken to the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, see your king comes to you. Okay, and then one more. If you go to chapter 27, verses 7 to 10. 27, verses 7 to 10. Starting at verse 7. So they decided to use the money to buy the potter's field as a burial place for foreigners. This is Judas. That's why he's been called the field of blood to this day. Then what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. Okay. All I want you to see there is you see this formula over and over. Look at the rest of the paragraph. Twelve times. Look at the next sentence. And 12 is one of the Old Testament numbers symbolizing perfection. What Matthew's saying is, in the Hebrew structure here, is he's came not just as your king. That's page one we looked at. But he came as the new Moses with a new Torah, five discourses, each ending with the same formula. And he fulfilled all this Old Testament prophecy. And Matthew just hammers that home 12 times through his book. He wants these Jews to get it. Jesus is the fulfillment of your Old Testament. But you see that he uses literary structure to do it. Now, go to the, down the next paragraph. This does not include all the other statements of fulfillment of the Old Testament that does not follow the precise formula above. Statements both indirect and direct. For example, see these two scriptures among many others that we don't have time for today. Just take a look a minute at 5 verse 17. And this again is in the Sermon on the Mount. Now, this doesn't follow that formula we just went to. But look what it says, 517. Do not think I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And then flip to 10 verse 35. 10 verse 35. For I have come to turn a man against his father and a daughter against her mother a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and that's a prophecy from Micah. So he not only he, he's got these formulas, he did this to fulfill the prophet, but then he's got these references as well. And then just look at the last sent paragraph there. Matthew's intent is to show that Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament scripture. He cites notice his sentence. He cites 47 quotations from the Old Testament more than any other New Testament author. Okay, so you see what we've seen so far, page one, he's your king, he's your king, enclosure, secondary enclosures, repetition, but he's not only your king, he's fulfilled the Old Testament, uh, he's the new Moses, and he's got these Hebrew structures, these first two we've looked at. Okay, is this clear at this point, questions, discussions, some of our folks need to, to break for worship. Practice, choir. right? Yeah, choir, right? Thank you for the choir. Yes. Always blessed by the choir. Thank you, thank you. Preach to the choir. Right? Yeah, it's preach to the choir. <laughs> okay, so so we got one more page to go, and we've got a little time to do that yet. But so at this point, yet yeah, any questions or discussions, clarification on what we've looked at so far? Do you see how when you see how Matthew's constructed? How much more meaningful it is. You know, we'll kind of read it through. Well, it's the life of Jesus, blah, blah, blah. I know these stories, but look how he structured it to get his points across. Okay, let's go to page three. This is the third Hebrew structure, and it's called the use of Old Testament numerology. So not only is this Hebrew structure these five discourses with identical conclusions to parallel the Torah, Genesis to Deuteronomy. Not only is this Hebrew structure these fulfillment uh, formulas of Old Testament prophecy, but there's a third Hebrew structure he uses, numerology. Let's read the first paragraph. All through the Old Testament, certain numbers signify perfection or completion. They are at a minimum the numbers 3, 7, 12, and 40. We don't have time to detail all the places in the Old Testament where this is true, but we'll just see how Matthew utilizes them 
to point to the perfection of Jesus. First take number three, we're gonna take four numbers, number three. In the opening genealogy, he structures Jesus' family tree into three main periods leading up to his birth. God is perfectly overseeing Jesus' genealogy. Look at Matthew 1, verse 17, at the end of the genealogy. Thus there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile in Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Christ. So Jesus' genealogy is divided into three main periods, and three is one of the numbers in the Old Testament for completeness and perfection. But now, look at that verse again another time. Thus there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Christ. Okay, from three, go to number seven on your page. In each of the three main periods above, there are 14 generations, a multiple of seven. Okay, we've read 117. A God-ordered history leading up to Jesus. Isn't that incredible how, how, he, how he uses those numbers? Note also in the genealogy, Jesus' connection not only to David, but to Abraham. Okay, look at 1 verse 1 again. Not only is he the son of David, but he's the son of Abraham. That's a strong message to the Jews. Okay, now let's continue with the number 7 in Matthew. In chapter 23, Jesus pronounces seven woes on the Pharisees. In chapter 15, at the feeding of the 4,000, there are seven loaves, and after eating, seven basketfuls, meaning perfect provision and perfect power. So you see that Matthew uses the numbers three and seven. And remember, in Genesis, seven days of creation, um, seven is used throughout the Old Testament as a number of perfection and fulfillment, completeness in God. And by the way, Revelation in the New Testament is also structured on the number seven. Okay, then go from three and seven to 12. Now we're not gonna read these, I'll just call attention to them. In chapter 10, verse one, Jesus calls 12 disciples, corresponding to the 12 tribes of Old Testament Israel. He is forming a new Israel, just as he is a new Moses with a new Torah. And then there's the number 40. In the Old Testament, Israel wandered 40 years in the wilderness. In chapter 4, verse 2, Jesus enters the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights to be tempted by the devil. Jesus is paralleling Israel. Okay, so questions or discussions on this numerology? Um, you think I'm all wet here? <laughs> but these numbers stand out. Do you see what a beautiful way this gospel is structured? It's just amazing. Okay. Now, uh, if I don't see any hands, we'll go to the footnotes. And I'm looking at my time here. We're going to probably end up early. Uh, yeah, yes, ma'am. Um, I've always found the common numbers about the 14 seems a little new to me. Um, and do you know any other places where 14 off the top of your head might be used? Off the top of my head. Okay, in in in, uh, in Revelation, it talks about 144,000, which is not which is a symbolic number for completeness. But that's not a multiple of that's a multiple of 12, right? Yeah. Yeah, but it's still it's still a, it's a, but it's a multiple of another number signifying completion. But I can't think offhand of another 14. Maybe somebody else can. Thanks, thanks for that. Okay. So there, yeah, Dan. Um, how, how do I phrase this? I think, for example, seven basketfuls, what you're saying is, or what the, the writer was saying was, I don't know exactly, but it would, but it was approximately, but I would say seven because it was sufficient, or it was, it was perfect. So, yeah, so, he is saying that. And I, I, I would say that there were seven baskets. Yeah. I, mean, I, I believe what it says. Yeah. But I also hear what you're saying, that he's saying through that, hey, even if it weren't seven, it was perfect provision. Right. 
it's my troublesome mind that I wanted to be precise. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to be true. And it, it doesn't have to be precise to be true. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay, question. Any questions or discussion on anything we've looked at so far before we go to the footnotes? On, on uh, what I want you to see is Jesus is the King of Kings in this gospel. Okay. You would think mm -hmm. that when the Jewish people read this, that they would have really glummed on to, oh my goodness. Look at this. He must be yeah. the king. Yeah, you'd think so, wouldn't you? Well, and a lot of them did. The first church was composed of Jewish people. But a lot of them didn't. Yeah. But Matthew, you know, an apology is. An apology is not saying, well, it is saying, I'm sorry I did that. I'm sorry, Cheryl, I left the dirty dishes in the sink. That's an apology. But an apology is also a defense of the Christian faith. That's another understanding of it. And what Matthew's doing, he's writing an apology in that sense. Hey, Jewish people, look at Jesus. Look at, he's your king, he's your new Moses. He's, uh, he's the fulfiller of your Old Testament. And I've structured my gospel to give this apology of who Jesus is. So that's what he's trying to do here. On the genealogy word, it's interesting that Joseph is also referred to as a son of David. Yeah. He is. He isn't actually Jesus' father. That's correct. He's part of the genealogy. But he's part of the genealogy. Now, when we get to Luke, Luke has also a genealogy, but it's different from Matthew's. Uh, and we'll see how that is true when we get to Luke. And Luke has a different, Luke's genealogy is just as true as Matthew's, but Luke looks at it a different way to emphasize a different dimension of Jesus. Yeah, but right in the genealogy, this whole first 14 verses, Matthew's laying out the theme of his gospel. Son of David, king, all that stuff. Okay, let's look at the footnotes. Um, I got two proofs that Matthew was written to the Jews. Just want you to note these. Proof number one, Matthew's written to the Jews. There is a lack of explanation of Jewish Old Testament customs, especially in Mark. For example, if you read Mark, which you'll look at next Sunday, Joel's favorite gospel. I remember that. Um, Joel, Mark has to explain Old Testament customs. Matthew doesn't. Matthew just, here's an Old Testament custom. He didn't explain it because he takes it for granted that these people will understand it. Okay, that's another proof he wrote to the Jews. And here's proof number two that's written to the Jews. It's the use of Jewish circumlocution. Oh, what does that word mean? That means that instead of saying something one way, now, I don't think I should say it like that. You say it another way. Okay, that's circumlocution. And see, he uses kingdom of heaven instead of kingdom of God because the use of the divine name the Jews used only very reluctantly. Maybe you remember that. That name Yahweh was just very carefully used by the Jews. And if you look at the other Gospels, they use kingdom of God. They have Jesus saying kingdom of God, but in Matthew, he has Jesus saying kingdom of heaven. And that is a concession to his Jewish audience. Now, let me read something about how sacred the Jews regarded the name of God. Now, bear with me as I just read this. Do you know that when the Old Testament was hand copied, I got this from somebody, so I got to read it. Do you know that when the Old Testament was hand copied, the Hebrew transcribers would fast and pray before writing the name of God? After the fact, after he wrote the name, he would bathe himself and then write the name of God with a brand new quill. After the name was written, the quill was discarded and burned and the clothes were burned. The next time the transcribers came to the name of God, he would again fall, he would again fast and pray and bathe before he dared to write God's holy name. The reverence and holiness of God's name in their minds was incredible. How flippantly we use it today. But they didn't. And on my only point here is this is why Matthew uses circumlocution, kingdom of heaven. 
We said the kingdom of God. Okay, let's go to some questions and some discussion here. That's how we'll end our time. Take any one of these you want. What does all this do for your appreciation of Matthew? What did you learn today that you did not realize before? How well do we read the Old Testament in order to comprehend the New Testament? When was a time when Jesus was especially Emmanuel to you? When you needed to be assured he was God with you, Emmanuel. Okay, is there anybody here who would just like to say, yeah, I'd like to answer that question. I'd like to talk about that question. You've got about four of them there in front of you. Anybody would like to start out and just kind of raise a discussion on any of those? I, I never realized how much Matthew proclaimed the fulfillment of the Old Testament before. I, mm. I, didn't, I didn't realize how many times he did. Yeah. Yeah. Twelve times. The formula is twelve times, mm -hmm. which is a perfect number. And then there's all these other, then there are other 47 Old Testament quotations. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, good. So that's kind of the first, uh, second question, right? Ken, what did you learn today that you'd not realized before? Thank you for offering that. Anybody else? Any of those questions? Do you, do you feel like you have a better appreciation for Matthew? First question. Yes. Yeah, okay. Next Sunday's Mark. Mark's a lot simpler. Um, but Mark has his own literary design as well, which we'll look at. Okay. Um, Ken shared with it what, what he learned he didn't realize before. Anybody else have something you didn't realize before? Sure. I think I would say for that last one, the last really significant time that I really felt Emmanuel God with me is when he went through your heart surgery. Yeah. Mm. You know, yeah. you don't, I just had to trust that God was in that process. Yeah. I had open heart surgery June 29th, um, this past June, and I've gone through cardiac rehab. And so that's what Cheryl's referring to, for those of you who didn't know that. Yeah. For me, when he had cancer and was going through chemo, which was a really, really tough chemo that he had to go through. And so many times, just just watching him sit in his chair, barely able to get mm -hmm. up, and um, mm -hmm. it so so much to and and the people of, of, that I knew that were praying for me or for him. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just. You could, I could just feel God there, oh. and um, it, it, I mean that was just a very comforting, comforting yeah. time. I mean it wasn't comfortable, but yeah. but it was a, it was so comfortable to know that there were so many yeah. people in prayer for both of us, especially him, but both of us, and um, it just it. I mean, God was there. Yeah, that was a time for you. He was Emmanuel to you. Yes. Very clearly. Oh, yes. Yes. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks for sharing. You, you know why I'm here? Because so many were so many <laughs> people were praying for me oh, yeah. that God didn't want to have to tell all of them no. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you got to get a lot of people praying for you, right? <laughs> Good point. I, I, I never learned that one in seminary, but I'm going to check that away. Anybody else in any of these discussion questions here? Dan? Well, um, just a footnote, since um, we haven't said too much about what's going to happen when you're in Hawaii. Oh, why don't you speak to that? Because this lesson is very good uh, preface to that, because we're going to be looking at the Old Testament scriptures that uh, foretold or prefigured Jesus. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe... Our discussion will be a little bit about how would the Jewish people have initially been um, misled by some of their thoughts when they, they read that prophecy, but how some of them were able also to see how Jesus did represent okay. the prophecy. So that'll go well with this lesson. Absolutely. What Dan's referring to is, is I'm 
I'll be here yet next Sunday. And then Cheryl and I are gone on a trip for one Sunday, one week. And then Dan is going to teach that class that he just spoke about. And then when I come back, then I'll finish with Luke and with John. So we got Matthew, Mark, and then Dan will teach a little different approach. And then we'll finish with Luke and John. Right. So that's so what Dan's referring to. If you have to. a Bible that has commentary at the bottom, typically in Matthew, you know, there will be references to all those Old Testament scriptures. But if you're reading the Old Testament, then the commentary won't be there. Right. Right. Yeah. If you read the Old Testament, then the commentary will have references to all the New Testament. So oh. you kind of go back and forth. Lovely. Yeah. Okay. There's actually a book in my study about that thick. And the title of the book is The Old Testament in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. You go, and this is thick. It's unbelievable. How, and not just specific verses in the, in the New Testament, but concepts and truths in the Old Testament that are in the New. It's, you got to take them together. Yeah. And Dan will, Dan will be doing that two more Sundays from today. Okay, we've got 10, it's about 10 o'clock. Any other just closing questions or comments? Okay, so next Sunday, Mark, and Mark has a whole, well, he has a different dimension of Jesus. And we're going to see how he structures his gospel to get his point across. And it's going to be different from Matthew. Even though you can read them all, oh, they're the same. Oh, they're not. <laughs> different structure, different dimension of Jesus. Thanks for your attention. We have communion today. That's a good thing. I'm looking forward to that. And... Uh, I'll see you next Sunday. And anybody volunteer to close in prayer? If no volunteers, I will, but just want to ask anybody who wants to volunteer. No takers? Okay, let's close. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, God, our Father, for the gospel according to Matthew. And Lord, we pray that you will be the king in our lives. May we not just be excited about how Matthew portrays you as the king, but may you be the king in our hearts and direct all that we do in our lives. May we read this gospel from this point on with a deeper appreciation and understanding. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thanks everybody for coming. Chuck, we're done with the course for the class.